Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your weekly host for this program, and I'll say it's good to be back at EWTN. Those of you who listened last week to all the special program we had, uh, calling our hearts to be in prayer uh, and asking for God's uh, mercy and justice as we face all the issues that our country is facing now. During last week's program, I had a chance to call in and talk to you about the fact that after last Monday night's program, I found myself in the air when all that was happening, uh, and it was uh, quite an impact on myself and my family. We looked at, again, experiencing from a very personal standpoint uh, how this can affect a family, but then I discovered that my guest that you all watched last week didn't make it home for a couple days because of that very issue. But here we are a week later, and it's always hard to kind of move back into the swing of things of a regular programming. And uh, there's a sense in which the, the theme, of course, of the journey home is our constant call to holiness. And in a sense, that's what, what happened last Tuesday. There's a part of that reminds us that every single one of us must always be ready at any time in our life, spiritually, to be ready to face our Heavenly Father. We never know when that might happen in our life. And that is the point of the Journey Home program. We're talking about following Jesus Christ wherever He calls us, examining our lives. Are we right with Jesus? That's the point of the Journey Home. Each guest each week talks about, through their love for Christ, what Christ called them to do and sometimes making very difficult decisions. Now my guest this evening is Linda Poindexter. And we planned that Linda would be the guest several months ago, but we found it a bit ironic that L Linda Poindexter is the wife of someone you've probably heard of, uh, retired Admiral John Poindexter. If what had happened last week had happened during uh, President Reagan's era, Linda would not be here tonight because her <laughs> husband not. would have been very much involved in what's going on. Uh, so we thought that was interesting that this had all happened, and Linda would be our guest this week. She's going to talk about her conversion to the Catholic Church. Linda was, besides being uh, the wife of, of General of Admiral John Poindexter, was an ordained Episcopalian minister, and she'll talk about her journey of following Christ into the Catholic Church. Remember, you're an important part of the program every week, so call us with your questions at one eight hundred two two one nine four six zero, or send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Linda, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you, Marcus. We were wondering a little here. bit about whether we should be flying this week, right? Yes. <laughs> you yes. flew, I drove. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was much safer flying than with my driving that distance. Well, I was a little closer, so I, I figured with all the delays that might happen in the airport, it was actually quicker for me to drive here mm -hmm. the 10 hours than to, to go through two airports and all of that. But I am struck by how no one is complaining about the inconvenience. That's right. We want Everyone's life is in perspective That's and right. nobody's complaining about little things yep. in their own lives. Yep. Makes us appreciate an awful lot of things. It's there. a hard way to learn a lesson. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's begin as we do every week and invite you to give us a summary of your early spiritual journey. <laughs> <laughs> it would be shorter if I were 25 and not 63. <laughs> well, I was fortunate because I grew up in a Christian home. I was raised in a church known as the Disciples of Christ, a very Protestant brotherhood mm -hmm. uh, with very, very faithful family. That's right. That's we right. were there, well, I thought it was the norm to go to church every week and go to Sunday school and be part of fellowship and part of youth fellowship later on. And I, I consider that a great blessing. Yes. I was learned things from an early age. There was a very interesting thing about the Disciples of Christ in comparison with many Protestant communions is that every service of the Disciples of Christ included Holy Communion. Hmm. That was considered to be pivotal in that life, which is rather unusual. Mm -hmm. I believe many right. will have communion once a month or some such. And it was, in fact, the issue over which they had split from other churches. The other kind of unusual thing, which I like to think maybe marked me from an early age, in the church I belonged to, which was a very big church, they had a small chapel in which my aunt was married after World War II, and it was known as the Madonna Chapel. <laughs> <laughs> which strikes me Doesn't now matter. as really unusual. Yeah. I grew up in Indiana, and I think in the Midwest, in a Protestant church, something known as the Madonna Chapel, with, featuring a picture of the Blessed Mother 
behind the communion very, table. It's very unusual. It probably makes you really curious now to go back and figure out what all that was. And I, how that I can't started. imagine. And of course, that building no longer stands. The church had moved and so on. But um, I began to date my husband when he was at the Naval Academy and I was in college. And conveniently, I was at the University of Maryland, so we saw each other every weekend. And we went to the chapel service. That was then compulsory at the Naval Academy to go to some form of divine service. And we always attended the chapel service, he marching in with the brigade of midshipmen and I sitting in the balcony with the other <laughs> dates. But at that time, the service in the chapel was always according to the Book of Common Prayer of the Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. always morning prayer, done very beautifully. So by the time we, he graduated and we married shortly after, we were so used to the Episcopal liturgy and, and liked it so much that it seemed natural for us after some church shopping in our early life to settle down and he had been raised Methodist and I had been raised in the Disciples and we both came into the Episcopal Church in 1959. We've been married for 43 years now. Which <laughs> sounds like a long time but it goes fast. But that was the church that we then raised our five sons in. It was the church that nourished us. Of course in a naval career you move quite yes. often, 18 months, two years, and you're up and moving. And we always made home in a new community by going to the nearest church usually and making a church home there and becoming active in a hurry. Okay. We left one place, they said, oh, it seems like you've been here much longer than a year. I've never been sure how to take that. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, yeah, interesting comment. When did you hear the, the calling to consider the, the ministry yourself? Well, yeah, I was always, uh, my life was what I would say altar-centered, um, very active in the church. And in 1976, the Episcopal Church approved the ordination of women. And I had friends who asked me at the time what I consider it. We used to talk about what we were going to do when we grew up, that is, when the children yeah. grew up. And at the time, I felt no, uh, no calling at all. I, I would you know, say, well, thank God that isn't my calling. Uh -huh. I don't need to do that. I even thought I might go into medicine if I had that opportunity to do it. Career. And then in 1980, we lived in Pensacola, Florida, and I quite suddenly, sitting in, in church one day, watching our priest administer Holy Communion, I felt, I won't say I felt God saying, this is what I want you to do, I felt like this is what I want to do, and it, it was such a demanding call and presented such yearning that I spent some deep time exploring that. My children were growing older and I would have the opportunity soon to think about school and career. And then we moved back to Washington, and I found out it's a long, involved process, yeah, but I right. finally began seminary in 1983 when I was 45, and I still had two sons at home, and my husband worked in the White House. And, uh, that was during that, the rough time, wasn't it? Uh, well, 1983, he, uh, he was there then until 1986. Yes, okay. So I can't quite figure out how I studied and got through during it all, all going to seminary time. and a husband working all that time and two sons. but. By God's grace, I was uh, then ordained a deacon in the spring of 86 and a priest in December of 1986. All right. and how long total did you serve then as a? 13 years. 13 years, okay. Mm -hmm. Usually as an associate? I served two churches as an associate, and then I served three parishes, one, two, three parishes as an interim rector. In the Episcopal Church, uh, the churches call their own rector hmm. with the bishop's approval. And this is a process that can take a year and a half to two years in both defining the parish and searching for a person. And you do some special studies, become a, a ministry specialist in interim work, which fit well with a naval career. I was used to moving in quickly, right. becoming acquainted and, and picking the up interim the Interim work, I remember, in the Presbyterian Church was an important position because uh, you had to make that transition from in that kind of polity where the congregation calls their minister. Mm -hmm. th that need for that interim was... Exactly. Uh, it was important to help the church heal or move on, to let somebody's let go of a very, very powerful and, and influential minister to move on to some of the different gifts. Yes, it, it, each one was different and had different needs and so on. Right. The, the last one I served, the bishop told me they need some tender loving care. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mom and a grandmom, I know how to do that one. <laughs> well, the theme, which um, I, I realize I didn't announce at the beginning of our program, uh, you've I've, both recognize that the theme of authority could actually be the theme of every Journey Home program, Indeed. in a sense, because it always comes down to the issue of authority. 
but uh, that made sense in our earlier discussions as we were planning for the program, the idea of, of the foundation of truth, foundation of, if you look back then as uh, serving as an Episcopal minister, um, at that point, what was the foundation for you to determine what you would preach or teach or counsel? Because that's, you know, we stand before Jesus one day for what we preach, teach, counsel. Uh, uh, yes. so how would you determine what a was the right thing thought. to preach? <laughs> well, obviously, Scripture. And obviously, if you're preaching, you're, you're trying to draw some relation from Scripture to the lives of the people who are listening to you, or to your own life, which is where they come from. And beyond that, in the Episcopal Church, you could go back to the tradition of the church, uh, to what others had said and what the church had practiced over a period of time. If we're looking for authority within the Episcopal Church, it gets a little difficult. There's quite a discussion in that church about what constitutes doctrine. Um, we could go back and look at what conventions. Every three years, the church meets in convention, a House of Bishops and a House of Deputies who are elected clergy and lay, and vote on weighty matters of the church. And that constitutes some authority as to what the church believes and what it does not believe or what it practices and doesn't practice. Beyond that, it gets a little difficult. You can go back to Lambeth, which meets every 10 years, and what the bishops say from Lambeth, even though that doesn't have a f the force of yeah. command, it is an important piece of the it. The audience has probably heard us use that word Lambeth before because the, the infamous Lambeth Conference of what, 1930, I think it was. The, yes, uh, that was that the was conference one of where them. the Episcopalian, American Episcopalian churches, right? The, the, the whole Anglican the communion, whole Anglican. as I understand it. All right. Decided that then they would break with the tradition to that point and allow for contraception mm -hmm. under certain circumstances. And that was kind of the beginning of the domino effect uh, that started the openness to, to that in all the denominations. The only church that's held to the tradition has been the Catholic Church on that issue. That's um, true. And now this is a big issue, this issue of authority for so many Episcopalians because as you said, it, you, you got the scripture, but then of course how you interpret it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there is the, the issue, you got that, and then you've got the 39 articles and other things, but um, as so many other uh, Episcopalian guests have said over the years, uh, that when you get beyond those things, the, how do you interpret, how do you apply it? how an individual has to live up to it mm -hmm. in the pew, that's where it gets kind of dicey, you know, and how to apply it in your life. Well, it, it, it is a point of pride in the Anglican Communion that doctrine is not defined too carefully mm -hmm. and that, that people sort of think through these things. The, uh, they talk about a three-legged stool to define authority and truth, and that would be scripture, tradition, and reason. Which is very interesting. Very different third leg there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The last week we talked about the three legs. Yes. In the Catholic Church. I tradition. know that's what it struck me. That great difference. Yeah, magisterium. Well, scripture and tradition were the same in both. Right. But the third leg, Catholic Church, its magisterium, mm -hmm. and the Episcopal Church, is this issue of reason. That's very interesting. Yes. Comparing those two. Now we would always say that scripture was this big a leg and, and <laughs> tradition <laughs> yeah. and reason were not quite as weighty as right. the scripture part. All right. You know, we, we would say that everything that was necessary for salvation could be found in scripture was the statement. All right, well then here you are, an ordained Episcopal minister, mm -hmm. 13 years, so that's, uh, you, you served longer than I did. I was only nine years as a pastor. <laughs> so all of that, I mean, there's a lot of influence there. There's, uh, mm -hmm. Great opportunity for ministry. Well, whatever opened your heart to consider the Catholic Church and set all that behind? Well, I was never in my whole life anti-Catholic. And, and now I will say to people, I think I've been Catholic all my life and it took me a long time to recognize it. But specifically, the kinds of things that began to open my heart to listening to the truth of what the Catholic Church claims, I think began fairly early in the time that I was ordained. Um, at the time I graduated from seminary, I would have said talking about issues of life, uh, and of course this is long after Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm. and I think I would have defined my position as anti-abortion but pro-choice. I want to define that practically in a sense. You I mean that I disapproved of abortion, but I would not approve of 
government interference to tell a woman what to do. Yes, yeah, okay, in other right. words, a woman's right to choose, right. which is the unfortunate phrase we yeah. hear a lot of. Um, I think in f that's a rather flip way of saying the Episcopal Church's uh, position is, because it's more nuanced and more studied than that in talking about abortion as always being tragic and uh, requiring great thought and should never be used for convenience or for contraception, and but always yeah. saying that there should not be legislation against it. So it's kind of a, the same thing, anti-abortion, but yet pro-choice when it comes down yeah. to it. Leaving it to the individual's conscience? Uh, conscience, yeah. right. you know, plus whatever counsel they had and so on. Okay. Um, Fortunately, the Lord did not allow me to continue believing that way for very long. It, almost as soon as I would think that way, I began to have misgivings about that position. And I think in part that I was, is owing to the witness of the Catholic Church being very, very firm and unwavering in their support of human life from conception. And also, I think, the position and witness of people who are not Catholic but stood very strongly for that. And of course, I think of President Reagan because my husband was blessed in being able to work fairly closely with him and know him and respect him greatly. And he was very unwavering in his support for life in the face, I think, of, of a lot of people that thought that was a strange position. Um, and at any rate, I soon began to feel quite differently and be strongly pro-life and even, daringly enough, preached a, a few pro-life sermons <laughs> <laughs> with great trepidation. Yeah. And since I was an associate then with the approval of, of the rector, who didn't exactly agree with me, but agreed that I could preach uh, my conscience on the subject, we had one parishioner who was a strong pro-life man and, and he, he greeted me at the door he said Lord now let us my servant depart in peace <laughs> for I have finally heard a pro-life sermon in an Episcopal church and I belonged then to, uh, after a while to a pro-life organization in the Episcopal church called NOEL which stands for National Organization of Episcopalians for Life um, not a huge group but a group that has held up valuable witness over the years and does very much to, to uh, support life issues. But that was an issue that bothered me greatly and as time went on, bothered me more and more. There were, then as later on, maybe some years later, we get into all of the human sexuality issues that all churches are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so many, although this has never been supported entirely in convention, it's not an official position, but man, many people in the Episcopal Church, mostly clergy and bishops, feel that it is an all right practice to ordain a, a practicing homosexual person. And many, many feel that the union should be blessed. And I know that they come to this position out of compassion, out of reverence for people as individuals and love. But I'm afraid that in that way it is mistaken and they have been encouraging people into a life that is not one that God would choose for them. Well, it was I, interesting the way you described it, that this is what they feel. Mm -hmm their compassion and feel. So you see you have on the one hand uh, what is moral, what is right, right and then you have this f feel, you know, mm -hmm. and so at what point do you kind of water down what is morally right or wrong to, uh, you know, to cater to feelings. Mm -hmm. And that's also what I hear a lot, that the group of bishops don't feel that it's such and such. Or yes. You know, and so we have these changes. And we need to feel good about what we're doing for people. <laughs> and it's, yeah. hard, it's hard to take a hard line with people. I, I understand that. And then there have been, in recent years, even some bishops, or one in particular in the Episcopal Church, that have written things that virtually deny the truth, in, the whole truth of the creed, yeah. or almost all of it. And, and, I, and no one speaks out against that. And I find that very difficult of a bishop who's charged to teach the faith and maintain it, leaves his people in confusion if one writes mm -hmm. that, for instance, there is no saving efficacy in the cross. Uh, people are entitled to wander around wondering, what do we believe yeah. if we it can't is, even believe in the creeds? And it is sad when you go to a, you know, a large bookstore and you go into the religious section and there is that bishop's book, so they're representing the Episcopal Church Yes. making these statements it's very that sad. are not Christian statements. It, well, and it does not represent the Episcopal right. Church in large part, but neither was it spoken to or, or did anyone come out officially and say this is not church teaching. Yeah. 
Well, there are an awful lot of Episcopalians that I know who share the views that, that you share, but stayed Episcopalians. Well, you made the jump. What, what was it that well, got you to make that big jump? Had it just been for these things, I did not say, I can't stay sure. here anymore because of this. Yeah. I have to go find someplace else that agrees with my thinking. I think what happened with all of this discontent and, and unhappiness with some of the positions of the Episcopal Church is that it left me open to hear truth from another source. Yeah. And then there was a, an immediate thing occurred, I guess, or, or event in my spiritual life. I was working in a church and there were a lot of things going on. It was very difficult for me to just go into this church and pray. It's very hard. As I've said, it's very hard to pray where you work because you keep thinking of work that needs to be done. Yeah. It's like a woman trying to pray in her kitchen. It's almost impossible. We used to joke that we'd be in our, in our pastor's office sitting there, you know, on our uh, desk, uh -uh. maybe like this, you know, and, and then someone would go by, I think we're sleeping when we're praying or, you know, the day. <laughs> <laughs> get, get the work in there. Get the work. Well, I am working. I'm well, if praying. I were doing that at my so desk, hard. I'd be saying, oh, I need to sort that over there and yeah, do this. And right. At any rate, I decided one day that I would just take a little vacation and walk around the circle we had three churches on a circle, three big churches, a Presbyterian, an Episcopalian, and a Catholic church. And I said, well, I would know the Catholic church always open. I would just walk around and go into the Catholic church to pray quietly over there for a while. Now, I don't think this is any accident. I, I, I don't subscribe to too many accidents in life. I think this was a, a nice direction given me by a loving father. But from the moment I walked into that church, and of course genuflected to the presence of Christ there, I, I knelt in prayer and felt such an incredible sense of peace and such a desire to just remain there. It, it sort of set at a time when I real peace was what I needed or calm within me, and I'm not a calm within type person. <laughs> it, almost the first thing that crossed my mind was could I possibly think about becoming part of the Catholic Church. Is this where I really belong? And um, yeah. needless to say, I found many more occasions to go around the circle. And, and then you know how addictions grow. I started sneaking around there when they had the 11 o'clock mass in the morning, taking an early lunch hour. And, uh, well, you were course, telling me you were taking your collar? Well, I didn't want to. <laughs> it looked pretty strange if I was wearing a black shirt and a clerical collar, so I would sort of slip the collar off and put a sweater or a coat on and <laughs> hide out. And, and I, I must confess, being an Episcopalian, you always decide for yourself what is right. And so every once in a while I would sneak communion, too. <laughs> because, you know, I, I knew that I believed in the real presence, so it would be okay. <laughs> a lot of, actually, it's sad. A lot of men men and women on the journey who haven't quite appreciated yet the distinctions yes. between a Catholic understanding of real presence mm -hmm. and other that we, we sometimes make those mistakes at first. And I had to mea culpa when I came in myself. Well, I think it's difficult to, to, to say, you know, communion is closed except to people here. We yeah. feel like, but, but it's the Lord's table. Everyone should be receiving. And that is, it's a hard teaching. That's right. That's right. Once I, you I still find it a hard teaching. Right. But once we understand why, because it is a sign of our unity and it's a yes. sign that we, it is important that if we say we, we're receiving it, right, we're saying mm -hmm. that we believe what the church says. Exactly. And that's the reason why. We're, we're part of that communion. Right. So how long did it take to make that shift? Uh, and was it a hard, uh, because it involved a resignation? Well, and it, not even from that church. Um, it took four to five years. I mean, I felt initially, looking back now, what I felt was sort of like you feel when you are younger and you date somebody that's really attractive. I felt like I was falling in love with the Catholic Church. And I think a falling in love, an infatuation, you need to step back and, and learn and think. I mean, I'm, I'm rather impulsive and I, I tend to lead with a, <laughs> that kind of emotional thing. So I needed to step back and take a look. and. I actually did leave the church I was working in then for personal reasons. After th I needed time, I was just worn out, yeah. and I needed to um, take some family time. And I had pretty much thought I wouldn't go back into active ministry. I'd take a longer time to look at what was going on. And I had a call from another church who desperately needed an interim, who happened to be five minutes from my home. Uh, it was just, you know, after praying about it, it was like one of those things that I had to do. So I had to put it all on hold for another year and a half, and then begin to go back into Mass. and So it did take almost five years. Well, sometimes actually being in service puts it all into perspective. I know that 
many of the convert or the men and women who are on the journey that I know who are serving uh, when they when they get up each Sunday to perform the sacraments and you're forced to address the issue are these sacraments valid and what I'm doing true is it right mm -hmm. that uh, can I, uh, make know. it difficult in that aspect of the journey that last job I, I sort of thought well I'll just put it on hold you know I, I won't go off to Catholic Mass one day and then in to celebrate Episcopal Mass another day and 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 so I thought I'll just set this all aside and maybe it will go away or maybe it will get stronger but every time I celebrated the Eucharist just before I received I would say to myself Lord I am not worthy to receive you which is not part of the Episcopal service and I just it always felt like I'm touching home a bit yeah, yeah. Um, we, the, the theme that we had chosen tonight to describe, which again is so common on the mm -hmm. journey home, is this issue of the foundation for truth. And I was wondering, Mary seems to be often the largest stumbling block for so many converts to the church, and maybe with the background of this issue of the foundation of what is true, where was Mary in your own journey to the Catholic Church? It's interesting. Well, I told you about the Madonna Chapel, which is yes. sort of this little <laughs> twilight zone thing in the past. but. Uh, the last few years I was in the Episcopal ministry, I, I kept thinking that I should really learn more about an Anglican understanding of Mary. And, and to that end, I bought several books, some of which I started to read. And you know how that goes if you're a book buyer. I kept thinking that I would put together a course that I could offer because I always I had the feeling that somehow the uh, the baby went out with the bath water that people had turned against a Roman Catholic understanding or veneration for Mary and, and left Mary completely out of their life and that we were losing so much. I think now with the benefit of hindsight that our Blessed Mother was doing some intercession on my part and <laughs> maybe I was summoned to understand uh, more about her. And it is, it's difficult and of course you know, people say, well why do you pray to Mary? Why can't you pray directly to Jesus? I said, well, no, you just ask Mary to help you yeah. along this line. You can pray directly to Jesus. You know, we, yes, I, we I haven't that. stopped doing that. No, of course not. <laughs> and uh, it's like uh, one of the great spiritual writers of the Catholic Church, uh, Francis de Sales, in his book on, on Introduction to Devout Life, calls us to pray to the Lord Jesus with all of our heart, but also says, but don't forget to also ask the whole great cloud of witnesses to pray right along with us, to, to intercede mm -hmm. for us. Uh, our guardian angel, uh, Mary, the other saints. Uh, I mean, everybody will ask the people sitting around them in church to pray for them. Right. You'll ask your friends to pray for you. Did the Anglican an Church have uh, basically the same view of the communion of saints? We certainly said we believed in the communion of saints, and I think to a great extent. Of course, one church I served was called All Saints, and we okay. celebrate the communion of saints. Right. Although we never used the, the title saint except in fr front of biblical saints, okay. but we did honor many, many other people in the calendar and honored them with their day, so, and considered the, the saints to encompass all of the family of Christ. All right. Why don't we take a break? We'll be back in just a little bit with your questions for Linda Poindexter about her journey or about this, this theme we've talked about mm -hmm. and that it's the foundation of what we determine is true of our faith. See you in a moment. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest, Linda Poindexter, has talk, been talking about her journey of faith, following Christ uh, in her good, wholesome, uh, faithful disciples of Christ upbringing, good, faithful folk, mm, very, very sincere believers in Christ, uh, brought her to faith in Christ. Then, of course, you have the calling into um, uh, the ministry and served for 13 years. And of course, becoming a Catholic, there, you had to accept some uh, changes in your own life, not just giving up the ministry, but even accepting the reality that the teaching of the church is for ordination of men. Just as I had to recognize that, that uh, mm -hmm. I had to set aside uh, priesthood because of the, the church's call for its priest to be celibate. And so you accept the wisdom of the church. 
on some of uh, these important issues. Are you ready to take a phone call or an email? Oh, sure. All right, let's see what they're asking us tonight. This one comes from Teresa in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I recently heard that the Lutheran and Episcopalians have formed some type of agreement which allows each to commune and exchange pastors between the two faiths. Some Episcopalians have told me they have an apostolic succession and now the Lutherans will too as a result of this. Can you address the beliefs of the three faiths as it relates to the apostolic succession issue? Maybe first of all, let's go back a bit. What about this agreement between Lutheran and Episcopalians? Is there agreement? On, uh, yes, yes, there has been an intercommunion agreement. Um, it's gone pretty far, and I, I, I don't speak on that as an expert right. because I haven't followed it in all details. But I know apostolic succession was a major thing to be dealt with mm -hmm. because as I understand it, and I'm no expert on Lutheran things, <laughs> uh, bishops are bishops during the time that they serve in that capacity and that they don't pass that on to other bishops by the laying on of hands whereas the Episcopalians feel that they go come in an unbroken line through the laying on of hands and now if someone is is consecrated a bishop I think both Episcopal bishops and Lutheran bishops yeah. will lay hands on which would then preserve that line but I'm not quite clear what happens with people who are already Bishops. Yeah, this is a kind of a touchy issue, I know. Every it, time for we, both faiths, it has yeah. been a very touchy issue. In fact, every time issue. we deal with this issue, I know I'll get a couple emails that are, will challenge what, what, I, what I've said here, because I know that even the apostolic succession of Anglican orders is, is questionable in some areas. Uh, and yeah. so, and also, I think the issue that arises is what constitutes an apostolic succession? Is it, is it the laying out of hands, or does it also involve an affirmation of the of the authority of the apostolic leader in Rome. Yes, you know, there's, yes. A, there's a both and. It's not mm -hmm. just a magical laying out of hands. Mm -hmm. And some will point to that as the issue. You know, I was touched by a bishop of such and such. Exactly. But it involves an affirmation of the apostolic succession in the seat of Peter. Certainly, as I can understand it, that's the Catholic understanding. Yeah. There's a, there is a divergence there. Yeah, and that's what brings the issue to the head on that particular issue. And that's why we have this struggle. We'd love to have everyone brought mm -hmm. in unity, but we have these differing of understanding what the same terms mean. And I know from my background, I was brought up Lutheran and Presbyterian, sometimes the, like the term Catholic in the creed mm -hmm. was redefined. Oh, I used to say Christian when I was yeah. young. See, the there's another way around it. Yeah, Catholic, yeah. Take Catholic out to make it more palatable mm -hmm. to where we were coming from. Uh, makes you wonder, well, what was the authority behind just changing a word in a creed? Mm -hmm. you know, that's a, a big issue in theological history. But, uh, but with this issue, as I understand, neither communion is, is thoroughly comfortable with what's happening with that. And some people say, well, they're giving up on something that's very important to the church too easily, and others feel that the ecumenism is more important, the coming together of two faiths. Well, historically, the, the Anglican movement refused vehemently to be called Protestant. Oh, yes. Yeah, so As the, I used to say, don't call me a Protestant. Yeah, I mean, so in a sense, I mean, you've got Luther rolling over in his grave and <laughs> not accepting what's happening. And I guess it'd be Henry VIII mm -hmm. on the other side. You know, they would, they would not have been oh, in no, agreement. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure either one of them ever really thought they were leaving the Catholic Church. That's but right, that's yeah. right. But they would not have been in agreement on their theology on the no, issue no. where you get the union today. Let's try our first phone call tonight. This is Ann from Michigan. What's your question for us tonight? Hi, greetings. Uh, earlier, Linda, you said that um, authority in the church or had an important role in your conversion. And what, um, as your knowledge and your understanding of authority in the church grew, did this affect your family life at all? In what ways did it affect it? How about the authority within the home with the husband and the wife relationship? Thank you, ma'am. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly authority had a great deal to do, as it always does. One has to deal with it. I mean, you, it's one thing to think you differ with your church that you're in <coughs> and, and choose one that agrees with you, but then you have to accept all that goes with it. That's I, right. I had to accept at some point that I couldn't be a cafeteria Catholic and <laughs> just go along with the Pope when we were in agreement. Um, I actually managed to learn just about that much humility in that process. As it affected the home, um, I, I don't think it had a serious effect in our understanding at home. Uh, I'm old enough to still have back in the back of my head someplace that the husband is the head of the household. <laughs> 
and I have a particularly wonderful husband who would never be authoritative in a, in a mean or difficult or abusive sense yeah. of the word, um, which you'd say you'll do it because I said so. I think we have a good partnership. And he, of course, understood a great deal about my conversion and so on. And as a matter of fact, may I share, <laughs> just on August 14th that John also came and was received yeah, into exciting. the Catholic Church. I we didn't so. to mention that. That's really great. Yes, we're very that. pleased. And, and by the time I was doing this, my sons had all grown and left home, and they all seem to have some understanding of what I'm doing, I, although none of them are following me into the Catholic Church as yet. Yeah. All right, thank you. Let's try another caller. This is Robin from Mississippi. What's your question for us tonight? Hi. Um, well, my question, my husband and I converted a few years ago. He really came from no particular faith, and I was a Baptist. Um, I've really embraced the faith and am growing in love in the faith. My husband is really able to embrace Mary to a much more degree than I can. Um, I still struggle with that, and I guess my real question is, why do I need her? Um, what can I gain from having a relationship with her, and how do I start about developing one? Thank you very much, Robin. That's interesting because I've sort of dealt with the same thing. I mean, one of the first things I did when I had felt some drawings to the Catholic Church was explore praying the rosary. I went out and bought a rosary and learned, got a little booklet that taught me the mysteries and learned to pray. And I, I won't say I'm really good at doing that yet, and sometimes I don't pray a totally concentrated fashion. And I have wondered over time, you know, what, what is my relationship with Mary? And I think it takes a lot more patience than I normally have uh, to come into that relationship. I, after two some years in the church now, and those years of praying the rosary, and now I'm getting more comfortable yeah. in, in speaking with Mary and in asking Mary to guide me or pray for me or help me out with a certain thing or, or be a mother to me. And I think part of it is, at, at my age, and here I've got five sons and almost 13 grandchildren, and it's sort of strange to think I still need some mothering <laughs> that puts me in a more humble position that I'm always not comfortable occupying. But I, I would say, you know, take heart and, and be patient and, and wait for that. And maybe it's easier for a man to feel that need of mothering. And there's a, you and I both were greatly affected by Newman, John yes. Henry Cardinal Newman and our, our journeys into the Catholic faith. Of course, he wrote a book on Mary, a very mm -hmm. great devotion yes. to Mary. But he has a statement in his uh, introduction to his essay on the development doctrine, which he says, to become deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Mm. And it's a very important statement. And I think on this issue of Mary, it's very, very significant because what you, you've mentioned is this idea about why do I need Mary? Um, and let's talk about that a little bit because Historically, what changed after the Reformation is this idea of that I really need no one but Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that grew over the last 500 years to today we have this indifferentism, which I don't really need a church, I don't need creeds, I don't need, all I need is Jesus. That's all I've got. And if I'm out playing golf on Sunday, as long as I love the Lord Jesus or have faith in Jesus, all it counts. And, but this idea of only seeing, for example, we could apply this to a lot of things, but this idea of, of just seeing Mary as kind of an add-on, seeing everything as an added-on to Jesus mm -hmm. is not historical, because in reality, from the beginning, we see, for example, in John, where at the foot of the cross, Jesus turns to John, his apostle, and says, behold your mother, right. and, and to Mary, behold your son. We're from the very beginning, mm -hmm. we're brought together with his mother. And this idea of I don't need anybody but Jesus, well, uh, we have to grow in humility. I mean, I'm not uh, attacking you, Anne, or the, the, in a sense, it's all of us, right? Well, that's what I said. It was yeah. very difficult for me to say that I need. Yeah. Uh, you know, I picture Mary. She was a 14, 15-year-old young woman. And <laughs> when you put that together with expressing this great need, it's a little difficult to be that humble. Yeah. And what also touches this is you also mentioned how how the way we ended up treating Mary in, in the Protestant faiths uh, kind of pushed her out of the picture and maybe talked about her at Christmas and maybe a little bit there at cross as if God just randomly picked some random woman 
and used her. I think exactly that is, but yes, she was just a usable person. Yeah. Sadly, that's the way we, per we, we portrayed mm -hmm. her. Well, I've even heard people say, well, God may have asked several people before he came to Mary, and yeah. she was the one that said yes, See, which sadly, was good. But. There's what you end up with. and Rather than seeing, historically, that the church has seen her as a very important, chosen person, willed by God, to be the channel through mm -hmm. which salvation would enter the world. And so it isn't as if she's an add-on, but that's why the church, uh, even though the church hasn't declared Mary co-redemptrix, mediatrix, advocate in a dogmatic sense, but that understanding as Mary, as a, as a God choosing her as a, be an important part of our salvation. She didn't die on the cross for us, but mm -hmm. she was the, the willing womb the well, willing woman that accepted. It may have been worse for her than dying yeah. on the cross to watch her son. <laughs> yeah. So we learn so much from Mary. I mean, that's one mm -hmm. of the main things we learn from her. She's our advocate. Uh, she stands beside us. It's, um, it's actually not a, 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 a burdensome addition to our faith, but a great privilege that we have to I be able to approach it. our mother. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we grab another uh, email here? We, not sure if we've answered this completely as we could, but we try to get as many as we can. This is from Don uh, Farenkrug. I think that's Farenkrug from Colorado Springs. I have never understood the almost universal acceptance of abortion by women who aspire to be pastors and priests. Mm. Why is it that the vast majority of women pastors slash priests hold a woman's, quote, right to kill her unborn more sacred than their right to life? So he's saying from his experience he sees them kind of link that women who get ordained end up being in the pro-choice camp. Was that your experience? Many, many ordained women uh, are, are, are fully and vociferously in the pro-choice camp. Uh, but I think you will find that many women who have presented themselves for ordination or who have felt called are in the forefront of what we used to call women's lib yeah. or, or activist women type organizations. And this is a piece of their understanding yeah. of, of bringing women out of an oppressed place, as they understood it, and into a place of independence. And of course, deciding what one will do with one's body is seen as the maximum amount of independence. Yeah. Uh, I think it's terribly sad. I also knew s many ordained women who were strongly pro-life. Yeah. Uh, and there were, there were more than you might think. Maybe we didn't make enough noise together uh, or were not as noticed. But I think it, it kind of comes out of where the women were coming from, from to begin with. Yeah, and I think some people, you know, as I said, my, my opinion was somewhat different, mm -hmm. even though I always felt that it was, it was a horrible thing to do, but I became much more strongly pro-life. And I think I pray that some of these others will hear that message mm -hmm. also. Yeah, my experience was, again, I experienced it in the Presbyterian Church where mm -hmm there was a, a large growing number of ordained women in the Presbyterian Church, that it seemed that because the scripture does not deal with the ordination of women, it has the ordination of the apostles, but not women, that my experience was that most of the women who were ordained, sadly what happened was they had to start compromising in other areas too because of the way mm -hmm. that their exegesis had to be used to defend ordination of women. And it kind of led to these other issues and, uh, and other areas that didn't have to be thrown on to the back of ordination of women, and that was other aberrant mm -hmm. lifestyles, as if it was all the same pork barrel, but it wasn't. Exactly. But sadly, that's what, what always happened. Let's see if we can get another email in. This is from Bill Townsend in Stevenson, Washington. My sister, who is an ordained deacon in the Episcopal Church, has been asked by her bishop and rector to enter the priesthood. They ask this as she speaks Spanish and ministers to the Hispanics in her parish community. I do, not, I do have trouble with women in the priesthood. I told my sister I would pray for her and her discernment. How should I respond to this touchy situation? So he's talking in the Episcopal Church. That's, that's Within the Episcopal Church. And, and there are many within the Episcopal Church that struggle to understand women's ordination or, yeah. or flatly disagree with it. I honored that as an ordained Episcopalian. Uh, and not all women did. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, we it caused you a major split in the Episcopal Church. Well, it did, and, and a few years ago there was something called a conscience clause at which bishops were allowed not to ordain women. People were allowed to hold to their older belief, and a few years ago in convention that was voted out. And 
I was signatory to a letter that I believe about 80 or 90 Episcopal clergywomen signed asking the church not to take that step to allow people to go with their conscience on this issue. Really? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, there were that many of us. Mm. Uh, we were outvoted, of course, and they didn't go along with us, but we heard from several people who did it thanking us for standing with them. I heard from one former seminary classmate who called me a traitor to, <laughs> to the cause. She just said she felt really betrayed. And I, I think it was a difficult subject. I, I don't know how to address this question, how you deal with it in light that it is approved by the Episcopal Church. It's not something outside church teaching. And I would suppose you just have to hold your own opinion but still love your sister yeah, and <laughs> pray that she will do what God calls her to do. I know the only reason I was ordained Presbyterian is because they didn't ask me when I was examined. I knew that if they'd asked me my view on ordination of women, I wouldn't have been ordained because I wasn't open to the ordination of women. But they never asked. Really? <laughs> That's the yes. only way that I squeaked through because it was yeah. a controversial thing in the Presbyterian Church and as it was in so many others. And the reality was it got to the point we didn't have that clause mm -hmm. anymore. Not only because the trajectory is that because the ordination of women in many ways is is pushed by the, the feminist movement, pushed by our culture, that in the same way <clears throat> the trajectory that I've seen in so many denominations is <clears throat> that in time the congregations are forced to, they must consider ordaining, uh, uh, not only now we're moving toward the homosexual issue, but the, their freedom to choose a pastor becomes influenced yes by the Equal Rights Amendments and uh, the movement keeps moving in that trajectory. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, peop women have so many gifts in ministry and I think the church is now struggling to use those right. in ways that the church allows. Well, I, actually, I'm I think that's, that. that's the message that you and I both give mm -hmm. to Catholics and, you know, I, I gave up the, the ministry to become a Catholic um, and you gave up your ministry to become a Catholic and, in a sense, we recognize and we're a reminder to Catholics that lay men and women in the Catholic Church have tremendous opportunity for ministry. It, it, oh, yes. And part of it is that we haven't recognized in many ways the, the, the calling. It isn't often uh, Catholic laymen and women, when they think of, of apostolate in the church, are only thinking about getting up on the altar and getting up serving. But we've got to remember there's so much that needs to be done in the spreading Incredible. of the gospel. Uh, let's, I'm going to do this email really quickly. Mm. This is a fun one. Oh, good. Are you ready for this one? <laughs> sure. Linda Cosgrove, Brookhaven, Pennsylvania. Dear Marcus, can you guess, explain to me how the Episcopal Church views the actions of Henry VIII? <laughs> 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 Martin Luther may have had some legitimate gripes which were later resolved by the church, but it seems to me that a man like Henry had no basis for schism other than his own personal gain. <laughs> well, yeah, he certainly had some personal gain in mind. I think yeah. Henry didn't... <clears throat> exactly regarded as schism. He just sort of wanted to run his own part of the Catholic Church yeah. over there. Um, well, we, we used to deal with it with some humor and with, then we would try to put it in historical perspective that there were other movements other than just Henry's divorce and there were all these political trends coming in. And, and then, of course, I did have, a, <clears throat> have some friends at seminary that having observed John Wesley's statue at Wesley Seminary said we should have a statue of Henry VIII that said our holy founder ever virgin, <laughs> ever blessed. But So we tried to deal with it with some humor and with nuancing it with some historical understandings of all of the other currents that were going yeah, on well, at the time. It's amazing when you look at that history that's come out of England out of that period that there became an official history. Oh. that was taught at Oxford and Cambridge and it was a bit of a revisionist history that kind of ex re-explained what was made it look smoother. In fact, there's a wonderful book called, out called Stripping the Altars uh, that, that actually does a, a great historical study of that time period it's, that demonstrates that in fact the, the church was alive and well before Henry VIII. It didn't need this great renewal. In fact, that that was a bit of a myth that the things mm -hmm. were going just fine, but that was something that was read back into it. Uh, maybe quickly, uh, before we take our final break, uh, how has coming into the Catholic Church drawn you closer to your Lord Jesus? Oh, well, I have a favorite prayer that I, I learned from actually an Anglo-Catholic prayer book, the St. Augustine prayer book. And it's accept, O Lord, my entire liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my will. All that I am and have you have given me, and I give all back to thee to, to be disposed of according to thy will. 
Uh, grant me only the comfort of thy presence and the joy of thy love with each I shall be more than rich and shall desire nothing more. Well, I find out now that I think that's from St. Ignatius Loyola <laughs> originally. <laughs> but it's a prayer that I have prayed for years, and I feel like since of becoming Catholic, that becomes more a prayer of the heart that I draw closer to that kind of goal of surrender. And, and part of that is the humility one learns. Part of that is learning what uh, mortification is, what making little sacrifices out of love are in terms of your own spiritual growth. And a great deal of it is rather took me by surprise since I thought we had real presence before in receiving Jesus' body and blood and soul and divinity and Holy Communion. Uh, has come as a phenomenal surprise to me how much greater and closer that draws me. All right, Linda, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for your witness. And and, uh, I will make a comment that you're going to be speaking here in a couple months at a conference in Madrid, Spain, that right? Indeed. Path to Rome conference. And and, uh, if people uh, want to know more about it, they can go to pastorome.com. (laughs) Pastorome.com, and there will be a number of converts speaking in Madrid Mm -hmm. about their journey into the faith. So let's take a break. be with you in a moment, and we'll talk some final words for the journey home. Welcome back. We just got a couple moments uh, in closing. Again, I thought it would be appropriate. Just a reminder, when we think about our calling of following Christ in our journey home, to be to reflect on, again, what has happened during this last week for us to never, ever take one another for granted. We just never know when it might be our time or those of our family and friends. We must make sure they know the Lord Jesus that they're faithful in the church and they're growing in holiness. And that's our call one to another, to remind each other of that. And so that's always the message of the journey home. We've got a couple seconds here. Would you like to say hello to some friends at home? Just my husband. Good night, honey. I'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) I wanted to make sure you got here on that plane. Right. Thank you for joining us with the journey home. It's always a pleasure. Again, we are to keep each other in prayer because we are in a spiritual battle, but together with God's help and grace. We can be faithful to our Lord and walk faithfully in our journey with Him. God bless. See you next week.